the, the subject I proposed tonight was uh, nuffs. And I chose just a, a short text um, uh, on nuffs from, from this work that's called Al Rif al Marif, uh, the gnosis of the Gnostics, the, uh, the, the hidden or esoteric knowledge of those who know hidden or esoteric knowledge. And it's a classic work by uh, Sheikh Shahabadi and Surawardi, one of the great sheikhs of one of the early lineages, the Surawardi lineage. And this translation is old and difficult in, in the English that it uses. Um, and I just want to use it as the basis for a discussion because it's, it's fairly short and it's a little clunky in the way it presents things. But whenever I'm using one of these uh, medieval texts, I, I really want to use it as, as a kind of dialogue through the centuries. You know, use, this is the way Sufis were speaking about things in, in this time. And, and to ask the question, are these things applicable to us? Do we understand them in the same way? And to actually dialogue with the text. So bear with me as I'll have to make this English a little more palatable as I go. And sometimes I won't be able to. <clears throat> so uh, Sheikh Shahabuddin Surawardi says, "Nafs has two." He says, "Nafs hath two meanings." <laughs> Nafs has two meanings, and I don't want to translate it just yet. This word, um, because uh, many of you know it, um, and it's gotten a bad rap, and you know. Um, and it deserves to be kind of unfolded. You see, there's more complexity to it. So nafs has two meanings. Nafs is shy, the nafs of a thing, which is the that or zat essence, and the hakikat, the truth of a thing. Thus, we are told, by its own nafs, a certain thing is standing, is established. So nafsi shai, the nafs of a thing, which is the zat, the essence, and the hakikat, the truth of a thing. So that's our first definition of nafs. Nafs is somehow the essence of something, whatever it is, the essence of a flower, the essence of a person, the essence of a unique personality, the essence of water. Whatever that essence is, is the nafs. So that's from one perspective. So he quotes, and I don't know what he's quoting here, by its own nafs or essence, the thing stands. It's anchored in its own essence. This one is a, a little more difficult to translate. Nafsi natika insani. That translates as the human rational nafs. But natika is a, is a word that can mean um, uh, rational or speaking. So this is... Uh, Referring to uh, well, rational or speaking, it's speaking to kind of a capacity to uh, communicate. Like, uh, what distinguishes the human being from from a cat? So, what distinguishes us from from uh, a cat or a dog? What distinguishes the human being. Well, that's what's often said, speech. And more general than that, the capacity to communicate on different levels, 
to communicate and understand. Um, one interesting thing about us is that we're amazing mimics. That when we're in nature, we're constantly mimicking anim animals and their noises, and we have the capacity to do it. Um, and to, um, you know, in, in, you know, in uh, primal societies, to, to mimic the actions of the animals that we hunt, you know, for food, and, and to learn their ways. And, and we have this, you know, amazing reflexive awareness, but, but, also, but often it's this, uh, this capacity to know self and other. Not that we always live up to it. Often, quite often we're not at all. But we have this capacity. And it's often associated with uh, the capacity for communicating and receiving communication as a, a distinguishing faculty. And so that's kind of what this is talking about here. This, this essence of being able to um, communicate and receive communication which is the essence of the graces of the body, which they call the natural human soul. So this is a kind of nafs. And there's a luminosity to it, which is bestowed from the lofty soul. And that luminosity, through that luminosity, the body becomes the place of revelation of both iniquity and piety. So, what this is talking about is that um, that in the human being, there is a kind of vital soul, an animating principle at work. And that animating principle at work in us allows us to, um, uh, to give and receive at a very high level. But, but, it's not determined whether we'll do good or bad things with that. It's, it's, a, uh, it's a general thing. It's a, it's a neutral thing. Uh, we'll, we will both uh, use in good ways and abuse this faculty. So it's, so it's saying the faculty itself is, is neutral. This communicating essence. Now the marifat the esoteric knowledge of nafs is difficult to discern in all its expressions, for nafs has the nature of a chameleon. So marifa is esoteric knowledge, more specifically experiential knowledge, as opposed to head knowledge, not just things that we have the capacity to understand with our minds, but we know it because we've experienced it. We've touched it. We've tasted it. And so he's, now he's talking about how do we know this thing called nafs? And what is nafs? Essence. Uh, a vital capacity. We might also call it the self. And that may be more helpful than the ego right now. Because the ego has gotten such a bad rap that we can't even talk about it in, a, in any decent way anymore. Especially in spiritual circles. Uh, it's gotten ridiculous. You know? Like ego is this horrible thing. You couldn't live without it. There's no life without an ego for us. Yes, we could do with less, but but I think I think in spiritual circles it's gotten such a knock that we forget that we couldn't live without it. How does this get things done? That's right. We couldn't get anything done without it. Ego drives the car, you know. It, it takes us places, you know. Um, uh, my teacher used to say the ego is a good manager. The problem is that it gets to thinking it's the boss. But you want a good manager for your body and for taking care of the needs of life. But you just don't want it to uh, 
arrogate to itself uh, the position of being the boss. <clears throat> so, but in itself, when it's uh, in its right place, kind of managing the functions of the body that need to get taken care of and the needs of a person, fine. It's just that it, it tends to get a little crazy, you know, power hungry. So I think we want to talk more about the self, which is closer to the definition that's being suggested here that the nafs is, the, is close to the essence of something. It's trying to say, um, what is itself? What is a thing in itself? What is at its core? And so now he's saying, it's difficult to name what it actually is. You can say it's its essence, but what is that? And, and you can't, uh, can't put your finger on what all the expressions of the self are because it has the nature of a chameleon. The self just keeps seeming to change from one moment to the next. It looks like one thing or another thing. It looks like one um, expression of emotions, then it looks like another emotion. It's constantly moving. And he says this, in one moment it has one color, in another hour it has a different form. And he says, it's like the Harut of Babel, the Harut, um, uh, according to the Quran, um, in the Surah of the Cow, I think, um, it's talking about in Babel, you know, in legendary Babel, there were two angels that were sent, Harut and Marut, and they were sent to um, uh, be angels that lead people astray with their sorcery, like creating illusions and, and trying to lead them out of the good path. And it said that they did this with God's permission and that they even told people what they were doing. You know, We've come to lead you astray. <laughs> <laughs> but then they're so good at it that they end up leading people astray. Um, but the people were warned. So that they're, they're angels that come to test a person's character and quality. And so he's saying that, that the ego is like this. It's like by its sorcery um, and its chameleon nature, uh, it leads us astray. So it's, it's like saying the self is a moving target, you know. You can keep following it, but it keeps changing forms, and you can't quite figure out what the self is. The self may ultimately be illusory. Hints about the secret nature of the self are found in trying to understand the secret nature of God. You hear that? that we can begin to understand something about the, the kind of esoteric nature of the self um, by meditating on the esoteric nature of God or the kind of um, hidden knowledge of God. What do we know about God? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> Bingo. So, the shadow of God. Mm -hmm. yeah. I feel like our sleeping mind knows something about God, but our waking mind has no clue. So, say more. What, would, what do you think? Um, well, this is from a book, which is a beautiful fantasy book, which has much truth in it and many lies. But <laughs> like life <laughs> yeah um, just saying that the sleeping mind the mind inside ourselves the subconscious or beyond that is this great wide thing which can understand the essence of things can understand the names of things even as it's ever shifting but that our conscious mind can sort of notice it little pieces but it's too small it's good at like counting things and 
deciding what to do on little things, but it doesn't really know as much as the sleeping mind. Mm -hmm. And when the sleeping mind wakes up, it kind of freaks out the conscious mind. The conscious mind is like, what the heck am I supposed to do with this crazy wild thing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it's also beautiful. Mm -hmm. This, this idea, the, both that what you're talking about and what Deborah is talking about um, is reflected in, you know, in the Bible. So when, when Moses uh, uh, goes uh, 40 days on Mount Sinai, and, and it says that, that Moses witnessed God, Moses saw God on Mount Sinai. But what we're told is he saw God's back. And, and it was because God's face couldn't be known. So just hold that for a second. And then later on, uh, there's a passage where, um, where um, Elijah is meditating in a cave. And he's compelled to stand up and walk to the entrance to the cave and and there there's a kind of a rushing wind and there's a you know a quaking and there's a fire and lightning and and he's having these realizations to say oh god is not in the fire god is not in the quaking god is not in in the rushing wind and yet there's a kol uh, de mama de daka kol de mama daka a still small voice and <clears throat> and the whole sense of it, both what's happening with Moses and what's happening with Elijah, is that God passed by. That's why Moses sees his back. God has passed by, and it's it's kind of uh, an awareness after the fact. That's why it talks about God's back, because there's an awareness after the fact of oh, something holy was here. I, didn't, I couldn't quite see it face to face, but it kind of comes afterwards. And, and it's, it's kind of what you're saying. We, we can't grok the whole thing, you know, because if our minds actually had our, the capacity to, to, be, to envelop God, then we would be God, you know. But we don't have that capacity. But there is, uh, that, that's not to say that we can't have a sense of something sacred or something holy or have the taste of it in our mouth or, or feel like uh, there was a something there. And that, that sense of a something is very important because we don't know what it is. It's just a, what is that, you know? <clears throat> Where's Pauline? We need French, right? Is je ne sais quoi? <laughs> You know, that doesn't express anything except that the expression that, that it's, it's, we can't quite uh, name it. It's ineffable. And yet, there's a part of us that knows it. And the interesting th thing to think about is um, we can't really know anything that's not us, that we're not related to. What's being said here is that um, um, uh, that if we can have this sense of the sacred, there's a part of us that's sacred. You know, we can only know what we can connect to, and so we may not be able to put our arms around it, the the you know the arms of our mentality around it, but. That we can connect to it means that there's a, there's a deep connection in us that knows it, in essence. So to go back, a lot of this is saying that uh, the self, the nafs, is uh, participating in the same uh, essence as God. It's an unknowable thing. Um, it's a moving target. You know, you can't put your hand on it. You can't hold it down. 
And this is taking it out of the negative. It's to say the real nafs, you know, the real ego may be the same in essence as the divine eye. You know, the human eye may be the same in essence as the divine eye. But through its, but in its chameleon nature and all the ways it expresses to us, we get, we get focused on the mask that the ego is wearing in a given moment instead of looking at how it can change masks. If we look at how it can change masks, then we see that its nature is more like God, God wearing all the masks. So we focus there, we see its divine nature. If we focus on an individual mask, we get stuck in ego, and then we get lost in it. <clears throat> he says, on the spiritual path, we have basically um, three relationships to the ego. This is often articulated as uh, seven different relationships, seven levels of the soul, but here it's just three. The first is nafsiya mara, nafsiya mara. And that means the, um, the commanding self, uh, almost the tyrannical self. Um, we could also say uh, this is the, the animal soul or the carnal soul. So um, the part of us that uh, is animal in nature from this perspective is problematic. Why is it problematic? It's, it's just defined that, that, that carnal self as uh, commanding and tyrannical. Not having control over it. Uh, and it's suggesting it's having control over us, this aspect of self. How it gets us into trouble. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think so. Um, but what I'm, what I'm wanting to ask is what's, what is, if not wrong, what is difficult about having an animal in us? It's not a dog. <laughs> it's, it's not a dog. <laughs> it is a dog. <laughs> But it's not a dub. It doesn't have manners. <laughs> it's not domesticated. It's not domesticated. Um, I mean, one problem we have is that we don't own our own inner animal. That the human, the human is also an animal. And then we don't own it. We act as if we're not. And then we end up being run by it. Because we're not aware of it. Without the awareness, it tends to just run the show from the behind the scenes, like anything that goes into shadow. You know, anything that we deny about ourselves ends up running the show from behind. <clears throat> and so if we deny that we're part animal, we, we act out of it without knowing. And, and become a particularly cunning animal because there's a tremendous uh, faculties put in its service. <clears throat> so what's the problem with that? Where does it lead us? Or is it not problematic? Self-interest. But what would it look like? What would be a self-interest that... Um. Survival, thriving, covetousness. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So the survival itself is not problematic, but but move to 
a kind of um, it, it can go into negative territory, right? Well, it gets, yeah, it gets like the same impulses get amplified beyond the basic needs. Yep. So greed. You go right by beyond the basic need, and and so it's like, uh, well, you know, it's like the squirrel, <laughs> you know, <laughs> endless amount of nuts, you know, like hoarded. And we do that. Like, how much safety do we need? How much comfort? Just a little more. Just a little more. <laughs> it's always... It's like, how much is it going to take to make you feel safe? How big does your house have to be? How many comforts do you have to put in place until you feel safe? You know, how big a couch? How big a TV? You know, how many rooms in this house until it's finally enough? It's, oh. We can only have one guest. That's awful. We could have two guests, you know, you know, in another room. And, and the refrigerator is so far away. If we could just have another one right here. And, <clears throat> and the thing about it is nobody ever feels safe enough. It, no matter how big the palace they live in, they just never, ever feel safe enough. And it's, but it's that, it's that same, it's that basic survival quality. Um, but it's amplified, as Joe says, you know, to a degree where it's, 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 it's amplified to ridiculous dimensions. You know, this is what Thoreau does. Uh, you know, he says, he says, I just want to look at this. How much do I actually need? Okay, so let me reduce things to zero and then build up from there and see, okay, I need to have food. <laughs> and, you know, I need to have warmth. He reduces it to about three things. What are they? They're, they're food, warmth. Water, too? Shelter? shelter, I think. Air. Yeah. He, I think that's in the food. <laughs> Air. It's a given. It's not a given. Okay. It's problematic. <laughs> but basically, that idea of like, oh, how much do I really need? And to, to actually be contemplative about it. And this is why he's a philosopher. He's just, he wants to actually reflect on all of the things that are assumed by everybody else. <clears throat> but to figure out what do you actually need. And, and he figured out that one of his needs was leisure. That he wanted to read books. He wanted to spend a considerable amount of time reading books. And, and he figured that's a human need. And so how will I support that? And so, you know, it's, a, it's fascinating to watch him go through this process. You, you read Walden. And, <clears throat> and so he was looking at the animal needs, but then also the human needs, which are not specifically animal they're not necessary well in as much as a, a human being is an animal but of a particular type that has different needs than other animals you know. and for him that included reading <clears throat> so this uh, this animal self Uh, requires some attention. It requires uh, us to to give it give it some thought. Here it's it's framed in the negative, you know, as as you know, leading to all kinds of bad ends. But if we would just give it its proper attention. I think we would understand ourselves a lot better. Like as a therapist for years, it became remarkably clear that lots of things that people were coming to me with uh, that were framed as um, psychological problems about which they had all kinds of guilt or different things were really just 
them trying to respond to biological drives that were driving them crazy because they weren't really taking into consideration the basic biological drive that that our biology, our inner animal, compels us to certain ends, which we, which we then judge, you know? If you're a teenager, this is, you're basically a, a biological drive all the time. <laughs> and, but then we're, we're not so aware of the drive itself as, as an animal drive, and we just keep thinking, what is wrong with me? What is wrong with me? Why do I keep doing this thing? You know, why, why do I feel this compulsion? And, and we tend to think, you know, um, well, I'm a bad person because I want that. Where, whereas if you just take account of the drive, you'd say, uh, it's working, it's doing its thing, and it may not to be my, my advantage in my life to allow that drive to exercise itself right now. But if you, if you had that awareness of your inner animal, um, it would save you a lot of money with a therapist. Really, it would. <laughs> because a lot of it is just that. Um, um, drives trying to accomplish themselves and then there are consequences in our lives that are, that are psychological. Um, but forgetting the animal, we think they're just psychological and we can't explain them to ourselves. They're like, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? Why did I do that? Why did I do that? And, and we think that there are um, also purely psychological explanations for all of these things. Well, some of them are just basic biological drives. It's not always that complicated. So this is to say, you know, it doesn't have to be judged. It's not positive or negative. It can lead to positive and negative consequences. But the drive itself is just a drive. You know, it wants what it wants. It wants what the planet wants. Renewal, you know. It wants diversity. You know, our biological drive tends to get that, especially uh, when it's very new. You know, um, systems in nature love diversity because diversity is new energy. You know, it's vitalization, you know, revitalization. Uh, Things that become closed systems tend to die out because they don't have enough diversity enriching in them. They get stagnant and die out. So nature loves diversity. And the way you get it in human beings is that you've got a drive that's so strong, you know, through teen years and early 20s that it, it will cause you to collide with the, uh, the almost exact wrong person for you. <laughs> um, <laughs> But, but who has genetic traits or opposite genetic traits or they're of different races or different things because the planet is just trying to get diversity all the time, trying to get... And, it, and it, it, it causes things to slam together, to crash together, create these explosions. Not necessarily great for our psychology and for, <laughs> for our, the life that we want to live from there on out, but the planet gets what it wants. It's going to get it. And then we have to deal with the consequences. And even saying that is weird. We have to deal with the consequences. We're the planet. We're an expression of the planet also. But it's this awareness, this reflexive awareness, that has two capacities. One capacity is to, um, is to know, to help us know that we are the planet. And the reflexive awareness also tends to make us think that we're not it, us and it. And so we have to use it to know both. It's a fascinating thing. <clears throat> but here, what it's looking at in spir- spiritual terms is that, that that's the compeller in us, that 
that animal drive is pushing us to do things that we would not. You know, as Paul says, I do what I would not, and what I would, I do not. You know, I do the thing I don't want to do, and the thing I do want to do, I can't seem to manage to do it. Uh, and often because, often because there's a compeller inside us. And so that's why it gets called, you know, the tyrannical self. Um, we're often just looking at the aftermath of the thing, you know, that we just did, and we don't even know how we got there. Why did I do that? Why did I say that thing? <laughs> you know, why did I react like that? We don't know. And so in that case, sometimes it's not just the animal self. It is uh, the unconscious things of which we're unconscious that are driving from behind the scenes. Why was my reaction so big to that small thing that she said? It's really not that big a deal. But in the moment, all this stuff came out of my mouth. Or, you know, you know why does that make me angry? Or why does that make me afraid? You know, you know that's, also, that's also the tyrannical self. You know, so that's not just the, the, the animal drives, but that's something that when we don't know why we do something, that can be identified as the tyrannical self. If we acted and we didn't know why we acted that way. Which brings us to the, the next level of self. Um, the nafsi lawama, which is the... Um, the critical self or the um, reproachful self, the repentant self, regretful, that's a good word. It has regrets. And that's what often happens after the tyrannical self has just acted. We've overreacted. We don't know why we've overreacted, but we've then are then standing in the fallout in our relationships with a, with a lover or with a friend or with a boss. Mm -hmm. There's the fallout, you know, and then there we are. And we're like, what was that? What did I just do? And we're left with the consequences. And then we have the regretful self. And the regretful self here is seen as a positive thing because it's, it's, it's now reflective on what just happened, about what just happened. And that's ultimately good. You know, it's only after we have regrets that we start to become mature. You know, we make all these mistakes for years, and, we, and then for years we're just blaming others. Oh, so-and-so did that to me. Why is everybody always a jerk to me? Everybody's always a jerk to me. I was talking to somebody about this the other day. And, and then, you know, when we say that consistently over and over for years, and then we realize we're the one common factor. <laughs> <laughs> and you go, oh. Then, then, then you have the regretful self. Was it maybe me? Not necessarily. But it's, you're at least a factor. You're the common factor. And you can't do anything about anybody else. So you start to reflect. Uh, you know, what was my behavior in this? <clears throat> I was just thinking of something. What was it? Uh, what's positive about regret? You know... It humbles you. It humbles you. It's what's positive about the mistakes we make in our lives. And we make them, and we make big ones, and we hurt people. And the only thing positive we can find in the end is that uh, with the regret we mature, and we maybe don't do the same thing again, or we don't do the same thing in quite the same way. What my teacher would say, he says, so much of the spiritual path is trying to get the oops before the mistake. <laughs> Oop, 
oops, I did it again. And so you, you got the oops on the other side of the mistake. And, and it's just like through reflection, being aware through this regretful self, being aware, it's just starting to move it back little by little, inch by inch. Being aware of the oops closer and closer to the mistake. Often we go, it's a couple years on. Oh, I ruined that relationship. I ruined it. I ruined that relationship, but it's three years later and it's gone. It's long gone. Starting to move it back closer and closer um, so that maybe it's last night I made the mistake and the next morning I, I'm full of regret. And I say, you know what? That was all about fear. That reaction I gave you last night, it was all about fear. I'm so sorry. If that, if that comes two years later, it's done. But next day, you might still be able to fix it, you know. And then to keep moving it back so that you're in the moment and it's about to come out of your mouth. <laughs> and you can grab the oops before the mistake, hopefully. That's, that's what the spiritual path is trying to do. <clears throat> to bring uh, the reproaching self, the nafsi luama, into the present moment. I will have regret after I say this. <laughs> you know, after I do this thing. Uh, and even in my meditations before going out into the world, you know what? I have a pattern of behavior. Today, God, I would like to not, you know, uh, I'd like to step out of that pattern. I'd like to step out of that pattern. It's getting the oops before the mistake. So the nafsi lawama is, is seen as, as uh, important, as an important stage, as an important process, um, ultimately positive, but can go negative. How can it go negative? The reproachful self. Or if you get trapped in it. And what would that look like? Getting well, trapped. Just, you're just beating yourself up all the time. Beating yourself up. No. So would you never you... actually change anything. Just hate yourself so much that you don't think you can change. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Then that's, that's valueless. Worse than valueless is negative, you know? Uh, the value in reproaching oneself is enough kick in the seat of the pants to get up and do something. But just a kick in the, in the ribs over and over and over doesn't help you get up. It keeps you down. <clears throat> and so um, in, in Hasidism, they tend to talk about the use of two different words for sadness or for... Um, yeah, kind of regretful sadness. One is uh, atzvut. And atzvut means uh, sadness, melancholy. You know? You know, and it's the kind of melancholy where today I don't get up. You know, I just turn over and I don't get up. And, and then, then there's another word that is merirut. And merirut is, means bitterness. There's a taste of this bitter, something bitter on my tongue. And what they say in Hasidism, they say, uh, atzvut is not so helpful, but merirut is. Because bitterness says, get up. This is unsatisfactory. So there's a kind of sadness that is unsatisfactory to agree where you actually say, and I need to stand up out of this. This is distasteful to me. I had a moment like this the other day. You know, um, it's like I was sad about something, things that had been going on in my life. And, and for a few days, I just felt like crap. I mean, I'm going around, I'm doing my job, and I'm talking to everybody. And, and when I'm talking to somebody, I'm with them and, and in the moment, and I, I might feel fine. But when I was going back to my apartment, I was kind of dropping into this place of not feeling so great. 
And it had gone on for two or three days. And I suddenly felt like, is this who I am? Is this, is this who I want to be? You know, is this how I want to live? And I immediately like stripped off my clothes, got in the shower, picked myself up, washed myself up, cleaned my apartment, and said, said that, you know, this is who I want to be. You know, and I just took hold of it. That's Jabbar. Jabbar, yes. It was, it was a compelling quality. It was a, uh, compelling me from the future, saying, what do you want to be in life? Uh, because I was starting to feel like the victim of, of my own sadness. And, and I could have hung out there. I could have continued to hang out there. But it started to become distasteful to me. I started to become distasteful to me. <laughs> and I had to wash it off. That's, that's my reroute. You know, like, like I'm, I'm going to take hold of myself and stand up because this is distasteful. Whatever, the, see, the thing that was sad in, in life was still sad. Um, and it wasn't a denial of it. I wasn't denying it. I was just saying, but, but am I going to live purely in reaction to that, you know, like drowning in that? Or am I going to embody my own best values? And we get to make a choice about it. <clears throat> so, if it's just kicking yourself, there's no point. You know, and that's a specific kick. That's a kick to the jaw. That's a kick in the ribs. But a kick in the seat of the pants, not so bad. Really not. Maybe not right away. And unless you do it constantly, because you can... You can like be in that space, being blank, not caring, just feeling awful, and then you like, okay, I can't do this anymore. This is sad. Mm -hmm. And then you start doing thing, and then building thing, and thing, and thing, and thing. I do this and this, and then it topples down mm -hmm. to the ground or below. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what's the solution? Do you think? Lift it up a little bit at a time, and be okay mm. with going backwards a little bit, and then going forward. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think you also have to make a little room for being sad for a few days. Because um, and until you've done that and even honored it, um, you won't get to the place of, of bitterness. But, but you'll know where the line is, you know? And you'll make a choice. Um, we all get to that place where, you know, we're sad and it's like, and I can go on being sad. It would be easy to do that. Or I can get up. And, and we don't necessarily make the choice to get up. But I think we usually know that we've, we're crossing that line. <clears throat> and so what it wants to talk about here is there's a point where we need to repent of repentance. Repentance. Repent of repentance. And that is where repentance is defined as uh, just being constantly in the sadness or kicking ourselves over our mistakes. And there's a point at which you have to say, you know what? It was a mistake. But if I live in the place of the kicking myself over the mistake all the time, I'm also not living into the future and doing some, anything different. I'm reifying that reality instead of living into a new reality. And so there's a point at which we have to repent of the repentance. And that, he would say, brings us to the nasi uh, mutma'ina, which means the, um, what does he say, uh, the, the restful uh, self. And I don't know that that's the enlightened self, you know, as they sometimes frame it. We yield and accept, you know what, that was my behavior at that time in my life and it wasn't helpful and I did those things. And I don't need to kick myself anymore, I just accept that's what happened. I can't, there's things I can't go back and fix, well, I'm going to accept them. It doesn't mean I wash over them, 
you know, like they were good or I, I make them all, I make it all pretty. It's just, no. It comes a point where you just accept certain things. Two or three years on from a, a bad mistake in your life, you just accept that's what happened. And things start to rest. I'm not, I'm not in the re- repentance all the time. I can't go on doing that the rest of my life. But I accept. And there's a lot of maturity in us around that when we do that. Um, or it represents a maturing. Is there an awareness in that? Because sometimes you can sit into it and go, oh, it's horrible what I went through. Oh, what a blessing. It's not something that, is that part of that or is that stage nine? <laughs> yeah. This was what it was supposed to be because you were immature enough. And this was what, so you look at it and you go, oh, it's awful, but it's good it was awful because. Yeah. I think that's on this, the spectrum of, of uh, nafsi mutma'ina. Um, I think it's on the far end of the spectrum. And the first thing is to, to accept. But gratitude for the, the crap that happens in our lives is, is difficult. And sometimes, you know, spirituality asks you to go there very quickly. And I don't, I'm not so sure that that's a good idea uh, to just wash, to paint over it, you know, with, it was all meaningful, you know. Yeah, yeah, I know you don't. Um, I, what you're describing, I think, really comes under the category of like enough time has passed where it gets difficult to ignore how the various strands of life came together to create this new reality you're in. And um, so, you know, I was telling somebody about, you know, at a certain point in my life, like I lost almost all of my friends and almost all of my family. And, and man, I was on the ragged edge because all those people are gone. You know, all your coordinates are just gone. And, and you, you find you've got almost nothing to hold on to anymore. And... Um, and while I'm looking back at all that's gone, you know, and I can feel it all gone be, behind me, and I'm unmoored, and um, it was very easy to be stuck in that moment. But as I continued on, uh, people were popping up, new friends, new family, and... And for a long time, I, I couldn't really take f- full cognizance of all the things that were springing up in my path that were positive because I was so full or so empty from what was gone, you know, and felt so much loss. But enough time passes and you look around you and you go, who are all these people? What are all these wonderful things? And you just couldn't see them for the longest time. They were there and they were holding you up. But, you know, you're so focused on what's wrong that you can't see them for the longest time. And that's, that's not a fault in the person. Um, but I, I think it needs enough distance sometimes for you to see the kind of miracle that does occur. But you need, you need perspective. You need distance to actually see it. Like, um, you know, there's a, there's a way you can't appreciate the mountain when you're on it. You know, you need to get back from it so you can see it's in its full majesty. So I think it's like there's, a, there's an arc to, to uh, the nafsi mutma'ina, you know, the, the contented self, where it's first it just accepted what reality as it is. And then over time, it can't ignore... Um, you know, all the beautiful things that are also there. It can for a while, but when you get enough distance, it's hard not to see, you know, all the things, or at least you'd, you'd be ashamed not to acknowledge all the things that you should acknowledge and, and be grateful for. So, yeah, I think that's part of it. <clears throat> 
So it goes on to describe you know, nafsi mutmaina as a, a place of rida, rida, or, uh, com- contentment. I think really it's kind of a place of a sigh, where you finally, you know, you've been fighting, you've been fighting with yourself, and you relax. So I think in the end this, this goes back to... Um, uh, what is the person in essence? What is the self? You know, what is the nafs? Um, it has all these masks. It's expressing in all these ways, um, and and it gets distorted. But in essence, there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, that that ego as manager, it's fine. That animal in us that is animal, it's fine. But uh, to be aware of those things is necessary, like, like Reb Zalman said again, like as long as, as, long as the, the ego knows it's a manager and not the boss, then it's fine. Um, as long as we know we have an animal that is driving us to certain ends, then we can still steer. But we can't steer at all if we don't know there's an animal in there. You know, so and these this is how the distortions happen, and they're as we said, they're distortions of an inherent nobility in us, and that inherent nobility is what he's trying to point to when he says that that the nafs is really participating in the same essence as God's essence, and it's in the expressions that the distortions start to happen. But in and itself, there's there's nothing wrong with it. Um, and it's not very different, uh, you know, uh, than talking about ourselves as, as, as unique individuals. And, you know, you know, we're very happy to talk about, you know, everything is God. Well, if everything is God, then God has all of these faces, some of them ugly, some of them beautiful. And, and, and we have to walk around working with them as God. And we forget all the time. And, and to... Um, <clears throat> what am I trying to say with this? Uh, that the distortions that happen with ego are not so different than the distortions that happen with individual human beings that are divine. Um, and so the, the question to work with is like, how do I become most authentically human, expressing myself in the most authentically human way in this life, uh, as a way of, um, exhibiting, um, the, um, the beautiful diversity of divinity, like, um, what is the most noble being that I, that I can exhibit. And it's not, I was talking to Peter about this the other day, it's not like the idea of a noble being and that we should all follow in this model. It's that each of us has an inherent dignity and nobility that is a unique expression of Natanal and of Joe and of Rahma and of Victoria, and they're all different expressions of nobility. Um, we all have our undistorted self that we can bring out. 